extremely honored and pleased and humbled to be speaking to you this evening. The presence of so many great thinkers here, magi, alchemists, shamans, and as my friend tells me, secret agents, <laughs> sharing their very considerable experience, knowledge, and commentary here with us make me feel the presence of the Mother Goddess herself, her eternal renewal and blessings. And it's exciting for me to have an audience like you from all over the world exploring our consciousness and then taking something back into the world. The organizers of this conference deserve the highest praise, and I want to thank Lucius and Dieter for their extraordinary work. But most of all, I want to thank Dr. Albert Hoffman, a truly great man. He made it possible for a lot of us to acquire a much greater knowledge of ourselves and the world, and to have access to the extraordinary worlds many of us have spent our lives exploring. To me, he is a living deity. Dr. Hoffman is the great, greatest living alchemist, and perhaps the greatest alchemist for a very long period of time. So when Dr. Hoffman became both the subject and the object of his experiment, on that day in 1943, when he unwittingly had that first trip, he successfully invoked a spirit that has lived amongst us ever since, a spirit that opens the doors of perception and experience, giving us the possibility of impossible thoughts and taking us where we thought it was never possible to go. Many, think, many of us think of alchemy as the art of turning base metal into gold, using a philosopher's stone or magic elixir. Using this analogy, the ultimate purpose of the alchemist is the transformation of the ordinary human life into the extraordinary by means of knowledge of the self. Paracelsus taught here in Basel that the whole universe is reflected in man and the keys of knowledge are the same. In 1527, the alchemist Agrippa stressed in a letter that there is a secret interpretation and understanding which cannot be conveyed by the printed word alone, but must be transmitted by master to the disciple echoing Pythagoras and Plato. Agrippa was very suspicious of faith. He insisted on direct knowledge of the sacred by its experience. I think it's fair to say that in the 60s, the experience of perception-altering substances, LSD and so forth, spurred a diaspora of trippers on various quests for knowledge all around the world. A number of signposts pointed increasingly to India, and many who I would later met, meet in India would tell me, in effect, LSD sent me. We had a glimpse of something and wanted more access to the extraordinary world in which it lived. It compelled us to take the psychedelic experience further and make some sense out of it. A dear friend of mine, Uma Giri, who 
who was a Swedish model in the 60s, who became one of the very rare female Naga Babas. She wrote, LSD parted the veil and made an opening into something else, into more than we had ever been able to see in and around ourselves. Its atmosphere was magical and mystical. But for me, these qualities were just not reflected in the English surroundings. The music, Timothy Leary, the Beatles meeting Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, all this said to us that India was where the magic, the mystic, and that something else might be found. People had smoked, though. That didn't do it. It was LSD that carried the idea of India to us all. At the age of 18, when I first came to India, I was enchanted by the yogi shamans, by the Nagababas of India. Naked in ashes, long dreadlocks twisted with marigolds, piled on their heads like crowns, proudly austere, sitting upright in some yoga asana, giving blessings to wild-eyed pilgrims, seekers and the poor. They shouted out mantras that charm or curse people's lives. That was the public image. They seemed about as far from the ordinary world as one could wander. Sort of my story as well, having traveled as far from the land of my birth as one could go. They were naked. They wore ashes from their sacred fire instead of clothes. They had few possessions other than their few magical instruments, their tridents, their tongs, their water pots, and lest I forget, their chillums filled with the magical sacrament of cannabis. It wasn't that they were mad. This was theater. There was a narrative something arcane from another age. If it was theater, it was also ritual. For where those two worlds meet, one being a mirror image of the other, the narrative of self-knowledge is performed. The act of making a pilgrimage is one of suspending oneself between worlds. Those locations to which one makes a pilgrimage are called tirthas, crossing over places. They are spaces containing the meeting of worlds, and standing on those intersections, one may be in both worlds at the same time. Tirthas mark the hidden entrances to the extraordinary world. They resemble a fold in the page, a hinge between the macro and the microcosms, a reflection of the inner journey on the external world, or a reflection of the heavens on earth. Those who go on pilgrimages become witnesses of mirrors. Pilgrimage is also a story, each pilgrim a hero, and every hero has a quest. That quest may take the pilgrim outside of his normal world, outside of the realm of society where new rules and laws are in operation. It means achieving a kind of immortality, as it were, as the pilgrim's spirit may be absorbed knowingly or unknowingly by so many human beings over time. And the human beings lend hands, legs, and tongues to that spirit.
spirit. May the earth goddess provide you all with health, happiness, prosperity, and knowledge. Worship a plant deity, hug an earth spirit, and by all means, hug and love each other. Thank you very much.